Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of FRS Recruitment Ireland's Hiring Webinar Series. My name is Derek Pearl, and I'm the head of business development at FRS. Basically, I work with employers to deliver customized recruitment solutions. So this webinar will provide expats and those making relocation plans to Ireland with information on getting a mortgage uh, with the bank. And we've a little on the jobs market and on the cost of living here, too. So I'm delighted to be joined today by Jean Cray. Uh, she's the Mobile Mortgage Manager with AIB, uh, and she'll discuss all things mortgages and lending. And I'm joined by Erin Whittle, who will discuss the cost of living, who is a project manager here with FRS Recruitment. So for those of you joining us for the first time, the Ireland is Hiring campaign started in November 2018, when we flew a team of recruiters out to Australia. And Ultimately, uh, we met with many expats down there for some events. Um, so we've, I suppose, we've evolved that Ireland is hiring campaign, and we're now working with the GAA. We're delighted to announce that we're working with expats um, and bringing them home. So we're sponsoring GAA Go application at the moment, and that live streams all the hurling matches and the football matches to expats here in Ireland. So we're going to provide expats with a full, I suppose, relocation experience back to Ireland. You know, everything from the job right through to um, help with relocation, housing, cost of living, etc. So ultimately, the economy here at the moment, um, I suppose in our last uh, couple of episodes, we, we discussed the jobs market and you can look at episodes one and two, basically through Crowdcast or through uh, um, any of our social media campaigns. And on Crowdcast, you'll be able to, I suppose, get into more detail about the, the jobs market themselves, what's busy in terms of the sectors, et cetera. So to kind of summarize where we're at at the moment from, um, from an economical point of view here in Ireland, the economy, I suppose, it is, um, it has taken obviously a massive hit due to COVID, um, but you kind of need to break into the numbers to get kind of an idea of where we're at and, and what type of jobs are available and what will be available for the next year or so. So the Central Statistics Office um, uh, reported about 15.4% unemployment in August, down from 176 in July. And ultimately, um, uh, it's a big number, but when you actually strip out a couple of important details, the unemployment rate is 5.2%. So the details that we strip out to get to that particular number would be um, a pandemic unemployment payment. And the government, um, I suppose, subsidise at the moment people who are temporarily laid off or employers that need support basically with wages at the moment. So as the economy opens up, and it has been for the last couple of months, that number will continue to come down. And to put that, I suppose, into real terms, the traditional unemployment number for, for, for August is 5.8%. So it being at 5.2% at the moment isn't as bad as the, I suppose, the pandemic pandemic number looks. And we'll see over the next six months as, I suppose, the, um, the unemployment numbers continue to come down as the economy continues to open up where we actually stand. Uh, however, that aside, we do know from, let's say, uh, like, uh, from the, a skills labor point of view, so high-end jobs in the likes of IT, engineering, manufacturing, supply chain, pharmaceutical, finance accounting, and healthcare. So I suppose any roles that require um, uh, some high-level skills, there's still a major shortage in Ireland. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, we went to Australia in the first place in November 2018 to launch the Ireland is Hiring initiative. It was to bring people back into highly skilled roles due to that skill shortage. Um, so the, the campaign, I suppose, as I said, ha has really evolved now that we're reaching expats all over the world in association with the GAA. So the GAA is, is I suppose, a three-year contract that we have. It's um, a sponsorship of their application that live streams all the hurling and the Gaelic football matches. So we're going to reach an audience, believe it or not, of about a million people every year for the next three years. Um, so we've many of those expats on the on the line today, and you're you're very welcome. Um, uh, ultimately, I suppose what you probably want to know is, uh, you know, from a jobs perspective, can you get work here, and and where are the shortages? So in IT, it's tech support, software development, security. And I suppose with the whole move from home type situation or work from home type situation, uh, IT is in very, very high demand here. And likewise, here your pharma roles, uh, laboratory roles, anything, I suppose, supply chain or food orientation, anything that kind of, you know, helps with uh, the current pandemic and dealing with the, the supply chain and, and, and the products that are needed around that remain extremely busy. Uh, so there's a couple of, I suppose, good news pieces that comes out of this. One is, um, Working from home has become, a, 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 I suppose, the norm now at this stage. And for expats who look to return, we've been speaking with over the years before, they might have wanted to return to, to Kerry, 
but the job that they really wanted was in Dublin. So the landscape there has changed. And now like the Dublin big corporates and multinationals are offering long-term work from home opportunities. So you're getting a Dublin salary and can be Kerry based. And that's a, that's a real game changer when it comes down to relocating cost of living and housing. And we'll go into that shortly uh, with, with Erin and, and Jean. Um, and one more piece of good news around, I suppose, the skill shortage here in Ireland for expats that want to come home is as I said, there are many opportunities and we're actually going to continue to pay for flights home for any expats that we place into permanent jobs. So that's just, I suppose, a sweetener to, to kind of show how serious FRS recruitment is and how serious this country is to get uh, expats home that have uh, the skills to, to meet the current needs. So um, before I start, I start speaking with Jean and, and Darren, um, there is a chat feature that you probably see on your screen, if you wouldn't mind clicking that uh, and maybe say hello to everybody. And you can also ask some questions throughout the next 45, 50 minutes that we're on this call. And I'll put some of those questions to both Jean and Erin. So um, welcome, Jean, uh, and Thank welcome, Erin. Good to have you here. Thanks, Minden. Great to be on. Great to be on. Good stuff. So, Jean, as a mobile uh, mortgages manager with the AIB, um, just to get the ball rolling on this, I suppose the, the big question in this current pan pandemic is really, are the banks lending? And if they are lending, is there even demand for mortgages at the moment? Yeah, so great question to start with. Um, and it's great to be able to cover this off. We absolutely are open for business. Absolutely. Now, they do expect the mortgage market to be back by about three billion down to the, the COVID pandemic. But what we have found is there's a huge amount of people that are now inquiring about mortgages. A lot of people have now savings that they thought it would be another year before they could even look at getting a house. So we are inundated with applications, which is great. Um, we, can't, we don't have enough houses in the Midwest region at the moment, but for AIB, we are absolutely open for business. And, and even through COVID, et cetera, we, we will be able to get you approval in principle subject to you either going back to work. So there's a number of things that we're able to do for, for people, which is great. great. Um, is it difficult though for people who've relocated relocated here recently? So we, we might have some expats that are looking at relocation, but for those who've just made the move, whether it be an expat or even somebody um, from another country who's come into, the, into Ireland and might be considering getting a mortgage, is it difficult under those circumstances when you haven't been living here? No, to be perfectly honest with you, there's, there's there's only a couple of things that we really need to kind of touch on to let people know what they need to do. So first of all, when you relocate, so if you're an expat and you're working here, you usually are on probation for maybe six months, but you can come to us and we can get you approval in principle, subject to you coming off your probation and being successful in being made permanent. Now, in certain cases, we can look to get that waived also. So it doesn't hinder you from applying for a mortgage or getting a mortgage. It actually is irrelevant that you were living abroad uh, there's a couple of little things that we would look for is a foreign credit check. So when you were living abroad, that you basically operated your finances in an appropriate manner. Um, and that would be kind of the only extra thing that we would look for from you. So um, absolutely, like definitely come in, come talk to us. The one bit of advice I would absolutely say to you is when you come back and you are considering doing a mortgage, you need to get in touch with a homes advisor and they will be your link the whole way through the mortgage journey. So if AIB's policies changed and it may impact, they are your touch point and they will be the touch point with you the whole way through the journey. And we have dedicated people and non-dedicated mortgage people in every branch in the country. So, and I'm mobile, so I travel, so I go to meet you, I go to workplaces, stuff like that. So, you know, you don't have to come into the big daunting bank as such. So, um, so yeah, so that would be the way it would be. Yeah. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, one question just in there from Katrina Evans, um, and her question is, what if you transfer with your current company um, and have a, I suppose, a, a local contract then in Ireland? So if you're based with, let's say, Amazon in, in States and you come back to Ireland, you're still with Amazon, is that seen as being in a, uh, uh, I suppose, long-term permanent job past the probationary period where you can apply for a mortgage straight away? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you're permanent and like we'd look just to make sure sustainability and income, but if you're working with Amazon and you've been working abroad and you're now locating to Ireland, absolutely come in and talk to us. Um, the only thing we would look for is if you had a bank account somewhere else, your foreign credit check. So I would encourage you before you move back to get your foreign credit check, because sometimes it can be difficult depending on what country you're in 
to get a foreign credit check when you come back to Ireland. Um, so absolutely come into us. Don't wait for your, your probation period or if it's a new probation period. But if you're just relocating back here with the same employer, absolutely, we'd be able to look after you. And how long would that, that credit check be valid? So if people were... So the credit check is only valid for a month. Okay. So we would need to get it re refreshed. But in saying that, you may not be able to get another one and we would be able to caveat that. So depending on what country you're coming from, like in Australia, it's fine. Experian do it. Same with the UK. Um, they, they, they're all fine. You can get them. You have to pay for them. Um, but they, they're they easy to get. But in some countries, you can't. But we know who they are and we can get them waived. But if you had one coming back and we could say, look, this is the credit check from X date, then we can use that if you can't get a further one. So the idea would be not to get the credit check until you're going for the mortgage if it's only going to last 30 days initially. Uh, if you come back here, yes. So if if it's going to be a country that's difficult and you can get all this on um, on the web um, where you can get a credit check. So if you're in Australia, you can, you can wait until you come home because it will go out of date. And in Australia, you should be fine to get one. But in certain countries, you won't be able to. So I would suggest that you get it and then come back. And, and then we can talk to you just around what we can do then moving forward. Okay, great. And then um, uh, for, uh, and we've mostly expats on the line today, but we've some, I suppose, uh, non-nationals as well, looking to relocate here as well. What's, what's the circumstances there? Is the stamp four needed before they can apply for a mortgage or what would be the typical um, uh, uh, line of, I suppose, uh, by the banks? Yeah, so you would need a certain visa type. So. When you come back in to work in, in Ireland, you need either a stamp four or you need a stamp one critical skills. So the stamp one critical skills, it could be a certain like a doctor, for example, or a nurse coming back that it's deemed that their skills are critical to Ireland at this present moment. So they will get a stamp one critical skills. Now, with that, the these visas, you must be working here for one year before you can apply for a mortgage. So that is the, the only downside to it, is that you must wait for a year and have worked in Ireland for a year with one of those stamps before we can look to, buy, to lend to you. Yeah, and that would make sense anyway. Like when we re relocate people over here, ultimately they have to settle into a, to a brand new system as well anyway, if they're coming from, a, from another country. So getting a mortgage in the first year wouldn't usually be uh, the, the priority would be settling into the job and and the culture and the way of life. And then it, it's going to be a long-term situation then going for the mortgage. So I think 12 months is, is pretty reasonable anyway. Yeah, yeah. What, what about if, if there's, um, if it's a couple and, and one of them is, um, is Irish and the other is Australian or something like that. Is it, is it is there a different process then or different considerations then as well? Um, my understanding is there isn't. It, 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 it does come down to the stamp and they must be in the country for a year. Mm -hmm. and so we would only be able to do it on the income of that other, the, of the party oh. Irish. So okay. that's what we would do is we would look at three and a half times their salary. So that's the criteria that we would okay. go with for a mortgage. Yeah, okay. Great, thanks. And then um, in terms of the big question, deposits. There's been a lot of change in the last few years mm -hmm. and there's different rules for first time buyers and second time buyers. So um, uh, is it different then for an expat who's arrived into the country um, in terms of the size of deposit that's needed there? And uh, if they're a first or second time buyer, is there a difference again in the deposit needed? Yeah, so if you're a first time buyer um, and you're an expat coming into Ireland, you're treated the exact same way as if you were an Irish citizen. So there is no difference whatsoever in relation to deposit required or interest rate or anything like that. So it's all very level level playing field. Um, so for if you are a first time buyer and you've never held a mortgage anywhere else, you have to come up with 10% deposit. So we will lend you 90% of the value of the house. And you just have to come up with a 10% deposit on it then. If you're a second time buyer, it's a 20% deposit and we'll give you 80% of the value of the house also. Um, the other thing to mention as well is if you are abroad at the moment and working and considering buying in Ireland, um, we will lend you 65% of the actual value of the house now while you are abroad. Now, at the moment, AIB are the only bank doing that. Um, and it, it is a beneficial because we will assess you on your current working environment as well. And, and where your current and your current salary, um, so it's kind of like a buy to let. Now the only thing about that is you do lose your first time buyer status, 
So when you do, if you if your intention is to return home in a number of years, you can't then qualify for the 90% loan to value. You just have the 65% that we will give you while you are abroad. Okay. Do you get many inquiries like that where people are looking to buy from, you know, before even coming over here at this stage with a view to maybe moving in six months or 12 months down the road? Is that becoming uh, more frequent or, or what's your own experience? It is actually, I have three applications on the go at the moment where people are, are considering moving back, but they're not sure and they're looking to buy now um, with a view to maybe because like obviously they've changed job and everything, but they may stay where they are for a couple of years. It just they're afraid with the way the, the pandemic is going, what, what will happen. So they want to go proceed and buy now. So uh, we are able to facilitate that for them, which is, you know, and we're seeing more and more inquiries around that. Um, I think a lot of people, when COVID hit, they realised how far away they are from home and that they've decided that they just want to come home. So uh, so we are seeing a lot of inquiries, Derry Cat. Yeah. And Dean, I remember like, we previously explored that ourselves when we were living abroad, but there was a caveat that you'd have to be home um, back in Ireland to sign the paperwork. Um, is how is how do how, how do you navigate that now, given given the situation that we're in? So, yeah. So technically, we are meant to meet people. Now mm -hmm. we can get documentation signed up with a notary in the in the country oh, okay. that we are resident. So that that once it's uh, viewed and and witnessed um, by a professional notary, we will be able to accept that. Oh, great. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, normally we kind of say, look, when you're home at Christmas, we'll meet up with you and stuff yeah. like that. So we probably haven't found a way around that as such yet. Mm -hmm. But um, again, it's evolving and AIB's policies are constantly being reviewed to make sure they're fair and 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 transparent um, and to benefit customers as well. Yeah. You know, so yeah. um, we'll see where that one evolves. Yeah. Right, you know, so but on a case by case, you know, if you're in any doubt or unsure, just please, you know, get in touch and we can talk through it. Yeah, great. Another question or a couple of questions in there. Um, one in from Robert and uh, this one always comes up and it's for the self-employed who um, can be treated quite differently than people in permanent uh, long-term roles. So what's the situation? I'm not sure whether Robert has re recently relocated himself as an expat into a self-employed job here or, or whether he's self-employed over and is looking for work here. But mm -hmm. uh, the question will, will, will largely remain the same. Um, if you're self-employed in Ireland, what are the, the rules around getting a mortgage? So the rules around self-employed is, um, the policy at the moment is that you have to have three years sets of accounts. So you have to be trading for three years um, self-employed. So we would look for, for the, uh, the three year sets of accounts, just um, your tax confirmation that it's up to date and six months bank statements of where the company is um, banking and six months statements for any other account that you hold. So that's how it's treated. So okay. you're trading for three years. So that three years, for if you're trading overseas, is that the same? Is it that taken into consideration? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's the exact same criteria. A self-employed returning expat is treated in the same way as a, as a self-employed person working in Ireland. Is, is that fair to say? That would be fair to say, absolutely, yeah. We would definitely take into consideration if they are working in Australia, for example, um, as an engineer and they're self-employed and then they come back here and they want to reset up, we'll absolutely look at it. Now, we will have to kind of make sure that the same level of turnover is achievable here. Um, we may, on a case by case, we may just say, look, we need to see you trading for a year here just to make sure you can hit the same levels. So it just really does depend on what they do. Um, for example, there's a self-employed doctor um, if he moves back or she moves back, you know, we can kind of say, well, look, these are the trends and these are the levels and these are the incomes. So, you know, we do benchmark against um, professionals here as well. So, absolutely. Yeah, cool. Uh, another question from David. Um, he's mentioned the HTB rate is at 10% at the moment yeah. of December and is asking, is that just because of COVID? Um, so the HTB is the help to buy. So this is for first time buyers in Ireland. So to help them to purchase so that obviously they don't have to come up with the same level of um, a deposit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually know if it is because of COVID that they've increased the rate to 10%, but it is there until the end of the year. So it may be, but um, I don't actually know why they have increased it. The, it's the government, the government that run it. Um, so it is, it, it is um, a, a nice one though. So we've had a lot of inquiries about it as well. So um, you can get up to 30,000 um, towards your, the purchase of your house if you've worked in Ireland and, and paid that much in tax 
um, over the past four years. Okay, no. for an expat then returning, they wouldn't qualify then if that's the case. My understanding is that they don't. I did a bit of research um, on it and you have to have paid the tax over the last four years and I would assume it's to this country. So I would say you probably won't qualify. Fair enough. Okay, that's the only uh, the only uh, downside so far anyway. Okay, and uh, a couple of more questions in. Um, uh, and it's about the loan to income in from Stephanie. Uh, mm -hmm. So three and a half times the salary to apply on the 65%. Um, and also, is this uh, is this only on mortgages uh, for homes? So I'm assuming she's referring to mortgages for buy-to-lets. Um, so three and a half times the salary required and 65%. Uh, okay. So if you're, if you're living abroad and you're purchasing in Ireland, it's actually relevant if it's your first home or second. It is treated as a buy-to-let because technically you're living abroad, so you have to either let it or have it as a holiday home. So the max will give you a 65% on that. Um, so it's it's if, if you qualify for 65% of it, the max is three and a half times your income. Okay. Now there is an exception for higher earners where we may be able to go to four and a half times your income. Um, but that, that hits a certain criteria as well. So please feel free to, it'll be on a case by case and it depends on your income. So just come talk to me if you feel that it's something you'd like to explore. Okay, thanks. The uh, questions are coming in now. Um, at, yeah. and they're becoming more technical. So uh, Kevin might have some inside information. He's just asked the question, um, do the AIB discount offshore salaries by 20% for expat mortgages? But I think, did you answer that question maybe a while ago saying that expats yeah. will be treated the same in terms of earnings and that? Yeah, um, so what we do is if, if you're living in, we'll say England, for example, and you're earning in um, sterling, we what we do is we stress test the exchange rate. So basically what we do is we add 20% onto the exchange rate. So if you were earning 50,000 mm pounds, because we stress test the rate, you might actually only come in at 48,000 euros because we stress test the rate. So we don't actually discount your salary by 20%, we, it's just we stress the exchange rate. So, okay. um, be a small it, amount then when it's just an exchange fluctuation, 20%. That's, it, that's exactly it. It's just, yeah. just to stress that, um, that if there was a fluctuation, and obviously there has been with COVID and Brexit, etc. So, um, you can see why the stress testing is there. But, Kevin, if it's a different question, just come back to me. Um, if I've misinterpreted what you're saying, there's no problem. Yeah, and we'll share Jean's uh, contact details at the end of this uh, this webinar, and they'll be on Crowdcast, and they'll go out in one of our e-sign letters as well. So I'm sure you probably have uh, more questions <laughs> after this, Jean, that we won't get to in, in, in today's uh, 45, 50 minute uh, webinar. There, so, there's a couple. More, there's a couple more there, just in the questions. Um, in the questions, ask a question. So I might just. There's one here from David O'Reilly. What mm -hmm. advice do you have for contractors operating through their own limited company seeking a mortgage? Um, say that again to me. That would be around um, what advice you'd have for contractors operating through their own limited company uh, seeking a mortgage. Okay, so we, so if you are running through, if you're um, a limited company, we look at your trading profit and we average that over three years. So whatever, and we'd add back a couple of um, kind of say interest paid, uh, depreciation, we'd add that back to your net profit. So we come up with your trading profit. And then we take your average of the last three years. Um, so that's how we would assess your income. We would also then look at your drawings. So what money are you taking as a salary? And then we just make sure that that balances out. So if you're taking a salary of 50,000 a year and your trading profit says you could actually take a little bit more, then we look and just make sure that we can take the higher um, income. So mm -hmm. we look at it a number of different ways, but we go by your trading profit, the average for three years. Great, I'm sure that, that answered that question there as well. Um, and I think there was one more there as well. So w just a question from Patricia. So she's um, returned home and looking into options to buy property, um, self-employed consultant with over 10 years working for the same company um, and has three years of accounts, bank statements and a strong credit report um, and a 35% deposit but would like to avail of the first time buyers buyer rates, is this possible? So the the rates, is it all oh, first time buyer, the first the 90% is it, she doesn't want to use her deposit? 
She has a 35% deposit but would like to avail of the first time buyer rates. Is this possible? That's oh, yeah. in interest rates, is it? Well, the interest rates um, are the same regardless. Uh, sorry, there's a buy to let rate, which at the moment in AIB is 4.85%. And then we have other bands then, um, variable and fixed rates. And it, it actually doesn't matter if you're a first time buyer or not, you can just come talk to us about what rate you'd like to go on. So you can fix at the moment, we have a lovely rate of 2.25% fixed, but that comes on your loan to value. So um, it, the fact that she has 35% of a deposit, she would get into one of the lower fixed interest rates to okay. be able to avail of that, or the lower variable rate as well. She'd get to 2.95% on the variable if she was looking at that side of it. Okay, perfect. And look, I'm sure if we can, she could follow up afterwards as well. If, if, um, if I didn't yeah, absolutely. That, that, absolutely. That, that, yeah. Correct. I think, I think they're the, the kind of questions with have answered all of the current ones now there. Great stuff. Yeah, I think we're up to date on those. Um, so the time of the job then, Jean, you mentioned, is, is 12 months really the key way when, for somebody who relocates over as they're saving and building up, you know, as the time in a job to, to become permanent? So even if they're made permanent at six months, is 12 months really the magic number that you need to reach to apply? Um, not necessarily, actually. I mean, once you pass your probation and you're permanent, and like we would just look at sustainability of income and sustainability of the job, you know, uh, but if you are there six months and you're a permanent full-time employer, employee, or even a, a permanent part-time employer, employee, we'll, we'll absolutely come talk to you. So like the, the, the key thing here is, regardless of where you're living at the moment, is keep a good track record. Uh, don't have any unpaids in your accounts. Show regular savings, that's critical to show that you can afford to pay the mortgage. Now, it doesn't need to be the absolute full amount of the mortgage loan or payment. It could be a certain percentage of it. And equally, if you're paying rent, make sure you keep a track of that and a record of that to show, look, I was paying rent to 2,000 euros a month. Um, so that's your proven repayment capacity. So showing savings, showing good, you know, a, a healthy um, attitude to, to, to um, lending is, is very, it, it's very positive to, to come in with that. Like your track record is crucial when we are looking at lending you a mortgage because the mortgage is for such a long term, you know, that your proven, you know, track record and everything is so important. And it's really, really um, taken into high consideration when we're assessing the mortgage that, you know, this is what you did in the past, actually, you know, it shows a good ethos. Um, so that should reflect in the future, regardless of what happens and what pandemics come, you know, we go by your track record. Um, so it's very, very important uh, to be saving. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and then in terms of the borrowings, um, three and a half times the earnings. So if you had a couple relocating from from the States, as an example, or Australia, and their combined earnings are 100K, is that a hard and fast rule that the, the maximum the mortgage can be is 350, particularly if they're looking at the Dublin market, which is far pricier than the rest of the country at this stage? Of course. Of course. So we have exceptions at the moment where we can go to four and a half times your income. So it just comes down to your net disposable income afterwards. Now this amount varies on occasion. So it, it's dictated by the central bank. So they do allow the banks to have either loan to income exceptions or loan to value exceptions. So at the moment, we don't have any loan to value. So that is if a second time buyer, we used to be able to go to 90% for them, we can't at the moment, but we certainly can go to four and a half times um, your salary if you're earning enough. So to your point, Eric, you could borrow 450,000, that couple, um, assuming then that they hit the criteria then afterwards that they don't have any further borrowings and that they can afford it. So that's the way we would look at it. So again, four and a half times we can go to. Absolutely. Fair, enough. Fair enough, that'll make Dublin a little bit more uh, doable then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Outside of that, you mentioned, you know, somebody who's, who's come in the credit check maybe from their time overseas and um, information on the current job and that. Is there any more evidence that, that the typical um, application for a mortgage or applicant for a mortgage needs to provide to the bank or what are, what's, what are the other key criteria? Yeah, so um, for any application, we need a signed application form completed. So that's where we get the majority of your information, how much you're looking for, what savings you have, what other debts you may have, and what other outgoings you might have. Mm -hmm. um, then we would look for a salary search from your employer um, and at the moment that has to be within one month of us submitting an application for you. We would need your last three pay slips and then we would need six month statements of any account that's held outside of the bank you're applying to. 
So, so if you had an account still open in Australia, for example, we would need six month statements from that um, just to show that basically account operation is, is, um, is good. And other than that, then the, the foreign credit check, which we talked about, um, and other than that, that's it. You know, we, we try and sometimes we, we make mortgages very complicated, you know, so it's a, an awful lot of it is about the documentation. And like the one thing I'd say to people is you're not expected to know everything about a mortgage. That's what I'm here for. So I'm doing mortgages a long time. Just come in, ask me all the questions that you're thinking. And because everyone is a little bit different and every case is a little bit different as well. So just come in and have a chat. As I said at the very outset, once you have somebody, a homes advisor, a mortgage manager that can help you through your journey. Like if I'm dealing with somebody, they have my email address and they have my, mo my mobile phone number and they can contact me at any stage. So I'd often get emails at weekends and stuff like that. I mightn't get them to them straight away, but you know, you'd be there at home going, geez, I forgot to ask Jean that just send me an email. So we're constantly in touch. And I think that's the one thing about us as a bank here in AIB is we really do stay with you for the full mortgage journey. So I won't be passing you off to anybody else. I will be dealing with you the whole time, you know? So, and I think that's critical because it is one of the biggest things that anyone will undertake from a financial uh, burden point of view. And right. it's probably the most, you know, uh, like significant thing that you'll do is to buy your home. So, you know, we absolutely get that it is it is very important. Super, thanks again. Um, good question from Robert here on the deposit and the three and a half times rule. Now, obviously you said it can go to four and a half depending on, on other circumstances. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of those circumstances is a 50% deposit. So it's quite a large lump sum being put down on a house. Does that, does that increase maybe the amount that can be borrowed? So it, it actually comes down to um, the value of the house as well. So we can only lend to the percentage of the house the value. So 90% first time buyer, 80% second time buyer. Um, so like the three and a half, so it, it does come down to the value of the house, but we, we will absolutely be able to give you three and a half times your salary. Um, so if it, if it, if it equates to the 50% deposit and you're looking for the other 50% and it's three and a half times your salary, absolutely. We will do that for you. No Fair. problem. Okay. But the larger deposit itself doesn't, doesn't extend the three and a half to four and a half percent. No, no, no. Fair enough. <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, I have to ask as well, Jean, I suppose, why AIB then as a, as a partner for expats and anything that differentiates you from the other banks? Well, at the moment, um, we are the only bank that actually will lend to somebody abroad. So you, we are the only bank at the moment that you can actually purchase a home here or a buy to let or a holiday home while living abroad. That would be the one thing. Um, we can also go to the three and a half and four and a half times your salary. Also, a lot of people that are coming home are actually doing self builds. So what in AIB, what we do is if you are in a, a nice situation where you're coming from a farm and you're able to get a site, we take the value of the site towards your deposit. And okay. again, no other bank does that. So that is huge for an awful lot of people because the value of a site, you're looking at 50 to 70, 80,000 and more, you know, so that's a huge chunk towards helping you build your home when you come, if, if you want to move back. Uh, I mean, 100% mortgage then if you were gifted a site worth let's say 100k or something like that or 50k and you were to build on it does that mean you wouldn't need a deposit generally speaking or you you may not need a deposit but you see we have the value so we take the value of the site as your deposit yeah. so it's not 100% mortgage because the input is there if yeah. you know so if we were to sell the house in the morning you know that value is there so it that's just, if you bought the mortgage with your your say or you bought the uh the land uh which are which are savings anyway so you've invested it into the land itself absolutely absolutely yeah so yeah okay brilliant um so that kind of leads me on then to the you mentioned aib are the only ones lending to expats who are living overseas i'm correct in saying that yeah yeah Okay, so let's have a, let's have a look at that that cohort. And uh, I know uh, the the you mentioned sixty five percent, but it, let's if we get down in, into the nuts and bolts. So how do they progress with an application? Is it all done online, or at some point would they need to be in Ireland to sign paperwork uh, with the AIB, or can that be done remotely? So at the moment, we are meant to meet people face to face at some stage to, through the mortgage journey. So in a lot of cases, people do come home for Christmas, but as, as I had said when myself and Aaron were chatting, um, that 
we may need to look at that again as to how we actually get over that. But we would be able to sign up documentation abroad, like a notary in Australia would be able to sign up your documentation. You would need a solicitor here also um, for the conveyancing point of it as well. Um, but currently at the moment, yes, we would need to meet you at some stage uh, throughout the mortgage journey to sign up documentation. Okay. Um, so the process is very similar really then to, to, to applying for a mortgage at home. There isn't a... Yeah. There isn't Huge, well, we can do we can do an awful lot online like you can scan everything to us um and we can do a lot of the legwork as such and give you an indication of yeah you'll be able to borrow this much or you know this is what we're looking at um so we would be able to give you an indication without meeting you you know we can do skype calls we can do it over the phone email and even with remote working now you know there's a lot of our homes advisors working from home so we've had to find new ways of working so um it's all evolving still it's all evolving still super and does it take long and does it take longer if you're overseas as well to go through the the application process yeah it, it generally it, it does take a little bit of time by the time you actually upload all your documents send them over to you <coughs> it can be a little bit more complicated because you it takes me a little bit more time to get through it because you're discounting the rate and stuff like that so it's just the length of time it takes to actually do the application and then you've to submit it for decision so the decisions at the moment are taken up to about two weeks um because we've had a huge a, a huge amount of interest in this you know we the mortgage market was meant to be back and it is back but our applications in the midwest were up five percent on last year so it just shows we've seen a lot of people that seem to be now looking at the Midwest as opposed to having to work in Dublin and live in Dublin, mm -hmm. because obviously the cost of living in Dublin and the cost of houses, like if you take like the average house in Dublin is about 380,000. Now there isn't too many houses in Dublin you'll get for that price, mm -hmm. but that's the average kind of, uh, and then the rest of the country is down at 260,000. So, you know, there's a big differential there. So, um, and even for renting, like the rental costs in Dublin compared to the rest of the country is huge. So what we've seen is a lot of people now that they don't have to work in an office in Dublin are now looking at the Midwest region to, to come live. Okay, very good. And then what are the other the other costs then? Um, so you obviously you have your mortgage application, are there insurance costs and other things people need to consider when applying? Yeah, of course. So you obviously have your stamp duty, which is 1% um, on any house under a million. So it's 1% you have to pay. And then you have your solicitor's fees. So they're generally, we kind of benchmark around two 2,000 that will cover the cost of that. And then you may have other searches, folio searches, which can cost about three or 400 euros. So you're talking about two and a half thousand probably to cover your fees and then the 1% to cover your stamp duty. When you get a mortgage, then you do need to take out um, fire cover for your house. So that will depend on the size of your house and how much you want to insure it for contents, etc. So that can be anything from 20 euros a month. And uh, uh, how long, do you know, it, it can be up to 100 euros a month, depending on how much you, you really want to, uh, to cover it for. And then you have to get life cover um, or mortgage protection cover. So again, our Irish life counterparts, they, they, they deal with um, our customers here and they find the service excellent. So we would normally use um, our Irish life crew here um, and they can do consultations over the phone and everything. So. Um, now, life cover is is a, a challenge for when you're living abroad as well. Um, so we'll, we, I'd have to talk to people on a case by case in relation to the life cover because we can't do it here for somebody living abroad, but um, you can get it waived for a buy to let. So again, case by case, I'd have to talk to somebody directly on that one as well. And so they're the only costs though. Uh, like AIB don't charge anything for the service. Um, you have others that, that do, but we don't charge anything for facilitating the mortgage. I was going to say, I think some of like the the um, mortgage protection, like that needs to be done as part of the application as well, doesn't it? Like in, you yeah. need that before you, you can receive your full approval along with um, yeah. some of the other insurances and, um, and yeah. valuation of the of the property. There's a few other things there as well, aren't there? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, that's another cost actually that I just forgot yeah. about the valuation. So there's a set fee for that. Um, it's 150 euros uh, to get the valuation done on the house. So once you've decided and once you've got your contract signed and everything, then you can order the valuation. So it's 150 set fee, um, mm -hmm. and it's um, that that it covers it all then, which is fine. Okay. Yeah. So to recap, one percent is the stamp duty. That's the tax the government charge yeah. uh, for purchasing the house. So for a typical purchase of a 300,000 euro house, you're going to pay 3,000 euro in tax. Yeah. Probably 2000 in in legal so you're at yeah. about five 
and there may be maybe another thousand in terms of life insurance and uh, and uh, um, and the rest basically yeah. so maybe, yeah. maybe about six thousand euro typically somebody starting off yeah absolutely off. so yeah so you'd be paying your your life cover and your fire cover on a monthly basis so that would continue on and uh, so that'd be a regular occurrence so the upfront fees would be as you said the three thousand if it's the three hundred thousand house and the two thousand and maybe another five hundred for searches and the valuation so yeah in or around that we cover everything so look at, i know from from my own perspective um the process can be a little quite lengthy as well and it's not necessarily the banks holding things up it can sometimes be from maybe the vendors and and, and just some of the legal documentation and paperwork but i guess from my own perspective it's, it's quite different buying um here than it is say in australia which is where, where i'm obviously from um that there isn't necessarily a um uh, a set period of time that, that you'd be moving in or that the, that the loan will be approved they, they can kind of go go on for quite quite a long time in terms of the the process um i think in australia we'd have a settlement period which would either be 30 60 90 120 days and 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 the, the property would go through on that particular date whereas i think here in ireland it, it can go on for some time what, what what would your comment be on that gene um yeah so like once so what i would recommend is when you are applying for a mortgage get all your documentation together just and have it and then give it all at once because if you feed it piecemeal it does feel like the process takes a very long time but once we have all the documentation in i have to have that application submitted for a decision within three working days mm -hmm. so that's the time limit i'm on then it goes up for our decision makers they have 10 days to make a decision or they could look for further information of clarification on, it could be a direct debit that's going out that maybe I didn't ask about, or they're looking for more documentation or longer statements or something like that. But once we get, like we can have a loan offer issued within two to three weeks, mm -hmm. and then then it may, it's outside of our control then because yeah. it's with the solicitors. So I think then- that's when it can be delayed, where yeah, it's our yeah, settlement it can, date as such. It can, yeah, it just depends yeah. on the property then. Like if it's a standard house in an estate, it generally can go through quite quickly hmm. but if you're doing a standalone house that you have to check for boundaries and all that kind of stuff and planning permission and yeah. and rights of way that's what can really delay it all right i think uh, it's worth bringing up because i think people may have that expectation that they'll move home and they'll be in the house within a few months whereas it, it could it could take a lot longer than that yeah, as well um, and i think with steve and lines had a question there just around if you are given mortgage approval, how long does this this last for? Is, is it six months? Is it is it? So with AIB, um, we can give you an approval in principle. So basically, what that means is, we we think you are good for say two hundred thousand, and until and come back to us when you find a property. But that lasts for twelve months with AIB. Okay. Again, we're the only bank that that does last for twelve months. Now after six months, we may just look for a little bit of new information, uh, and with COVID we must have a new pay slip and a new salary search within one month of us going for loan approval. So for the loan offer issue. So, um, but last, it lasts 12 months. So you can go shopping for 12 months with it. Yeah. That's great. And then I think there was a question there just back to the, the buy to let. Emma was just asking, what's the definition of a, of a buy to let? Um, like, are there any particular rules around how long it should be let for? Um, so, no. if, if so they're planning to move home yeah. um, within six to 12 months and want to live in it, like, are there any sort of rules around that buy to let? So yeah, that's probably our terminology of a buy to let. Um, mm. so you can buy a house here. Uh, you don't have to rent it. You know, if you think I might stay in Australia, I'm not sure, but I want to buy a house, I want to get on the property market in, in, uh, in Ireland. You can buy that, and if you decide you're moving home six months after you purchase it, that is fine. So the rate you'll be on will be a higher rate for a buy-to-let, so we'll keep continue with the buy-to-let terminology. Um, <laughs> but once you get a bill, you can send that bill to us, and we can reduce the rate to um, your, your actual home rate. So that'll be way less. So our highest rate at the moment is 3.15. That's a variable rate, but our lowest is 2.25. So that's a huge reduction on the buy to let rate. So all you'd need to do is show proof that you're actually living in the country and we'll be able to reduce your rate for you. That's wow. great. So 4.85 just while they're overseas. And as soon as uh, the person moves home, it goes down to as low as 2.25. Yeah, potentially, yeah. Super. Mm. Uh, the question as well, actually, um, 
on on tax implications this mightn't be one that you might be able to answer might be an accountant um what are the tax implications of buy to let from abroad so i presume that's probably in relation to the double taxation laws around where you pay your tax and how much tax you'd pay on rental income from abroad i'm, I'm guessing that's what it's referring to yeah. i actually i'm unsure i know you'd have to obviously declare it here and pay your tax on it but i'm not i wouldn't i wouldn't be the person to answer that now i'm afraid yeah that's probably yeah. a, a referral to revenue or we might cover that in one of our um our up and coming uh, webinars just around taxes as, as, a, as a cost of people mm -hmm. so we'll come we'll come back to that one i think and uh, another one in from kevin um expat mortgages are considered by to let would you take account of the potential rental income as would be the case in australia with an investment property so okay mm -hmm. um so up until very recently um our policy changed so prior to that yes we would have taken it into account but unfortunately if it is your very first buy to let um we won't be able to take it into consideration i'm afraid our policy has changed on that recently so we would just be able to just take your income um and assess it on that we can't take any future potential rental income if it is your first buy to let if it is a subsequent one we can absolutely take it in but if it's your first one we won't unfortunately and um, uh, we had a question actually before the, the, the webinar as well, um, and it was around, I suppose, uh, expat returning home, how much they realistically uh, need to have saved. And it was a quite specific question for, let's say, a four bedroom house in, in yeah. North Dublin, so deposit, no taxes, charges. I think we've covered a lot of that. Um, um, and then uh, uh, can you clarify, do the banks charge expats higher interest? And they don't. So yeah. we're pretty covered on that one, I think, are we? I think we are, yeah, like it's the 10%. So if you're buying a house in North County, Dublin or wherever, you know, yeah. you might get a house for 400,000 there. You, you need the 10% deposit if you're a first time buyer. Um, if you're coming back to the country, we don't charge you anything different. There's no additional fees or higher rates or anything just because you may not have a credit history here. We go by your credit history from where you've been living. So that's why the credit, the credit check is so important because if you're in Ireland, we go through the ICB, the Irish Credit Bureau, um so that's why we would ask you to bring that with you as well so it's very important people may be getting confused with car insurance but that's another we, we, we won't go into that today <laughs> <laughs> next one i think um so Jean, i'm going to take you out of the hot seat temporarily i'm sure more questions will come through and as i said after this webinar um at the end of the webinar we'll share your contact details through an e-sign letter that we send out and it'll be available obviously uh, on the uh, on the chat as well your contact details so people can get in touch with you afterwards and keep those questions coming and uh, and i'm sure that you look after it pretty well mm -hmm. so erin in the hot seat <laughs> i'd like to talk to you about the cost of living and erin i suppose as as as, as you as uh, she's uh, already referred to has re relocated herself from australia in recent times so we'll have experience i suppose with comparing um, the cost of living abroad, what it was like when 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 Erin moved over here herself. So on that note, um, how did you find, I suppose, the move yourself, Erin, from Australia? Did you find Ireland was expensive? And can you go into a little bit more detail around um, uh, around that piece? Well, I think the biggest difference for me was that um, I moved from sort of living in, in in Melbourne in the suburb, not not too far from from the city, I guess. And now I'm living in um, a, a country a country town, I'd call it, a village in in Offaly. So. Um, for me, the cost of living, you know, is it's definitely you know a lot a lot less for me in terms of the cost of living. Um, that said, if I was living in Dublin, it, it may be more kind of on par with with the, the types of expenses that we had living living in Melbourne. Um, I guess one thing I would note as well that the, the salaries are different here; they are less, but then the expenses, the the cost of property, the cost of rent, um, you know, your groceries and, and and everything else in between is is also a lot less as well. So, um, uh, but definitely living, I think for me, living living outside of the city um, certainly pays off for, for us and um, and uh, yeah, at the moment, you know, it's, it's great that that. Um, you know, there are a lot of companies offering um, remote working opportunities as well, so more people can, can live in, in more of those kind of rural, regional settings as well. Super. And you mentioned on the salary side, and yeah, definitely in Australia uh, and uh, certain cities around the world, uh, in other parts, you're going to have very high wages and um, mm -hmm. the salaries in Ireland, uh, comparable to the rest of Europe, are pretty high. There's only a couple of exceptions, like so Switzerland and Germany, that mm -hmm. would really rank above us. So on that note, um, what are the typical salaries or the average salaries are in here? 
So here, um, I think I think just recently the CSO um, had had some stats out just in terms of the average salary here in Ireland being around four to two thousand euro, um, and I guess minimum wage is around ten ten euro ten per hour. So that just give people a bit of an idea in terms of ballpark ballpark figures. If anyone is interested in, in more around sort of salaries and, and the types of opportunities, we, I think Derek mentioned we did have a, a webinar a few weeks ago that would go into some of that detail. But we'll also have our contact details. So if you are actually just looking to, to get some an idea around what type of salary you'd be looking at, um, um, you know, just have those details, reach out to the team and they'll be able to come back to you just to give you a bit of an idea in terms of what that, what that would look like. Um, so, yeah, that. That that would be my sort of thoughts there there on on salaries mm -hmm. here here in Ireland. Um, I think and consultants can can help on that side. I suppose we have we cover all sectors from manufacturing, mm -hmm. engineering, IT, healthcare, through to commercial, your accounting, finance, and that. So we'll have specific information depending on what sector somebody's in that we can we can help people out mm -hmm. with as they approach us. Yeah, I think one of the big the other sort of things I guess for us moving over was. Um, so the cost of, of say schooling, childcare, um, and that type of thing, and obviously that once again there are big differences between say living in in, in the city in, in Dublin and then and out, outside of Dublin. But I think say for example, childcare, full time childcare for for a child under five, um, we're lo looking at around two hundred and forty per week, two hundred forty euro per week um, in Dublin, probably more around sort of. 150 to 1 sort of 75 more in the kind of regional areas just to give people a kind of a ballpark ballpark figure on that um, whereas I know in Australia it was you know up to up to like 140 per day 140 40 dollars per day so certainly um, you know big, big differences there in terms of, of childcare as well mm -hmm. um, and the government are trying to tackle childcare costs here as well in a more kind of meaningful way over the next coming years to bring down yeah. And, and, and make sure people are working. Yeah. And actually, yeah, I was going to say about schooling as well. Sorry, Derek. So for us, um, the cost of, of then um, primary and say secondary schooling was also something that we were factoring into. You know, where we're at with the kids as well, and um, you know, the education. I know education is say is free, say in in Australia as well, but there's there's quite a lot of cost in terms of school fees, books, uniforms, and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then there's a lot of the schools over there would be private. There'd be a big kind of push towards the, the private secondary schools as well. Um, over here, I think the, the private secondary schools range they sets from around say four thousand euro per year to eight thousand for the really, um, you know, the, the more um, expensive ones say in, in the cities. Um, and I think in terms of your secondary schools, your, your public your public ones here, um, they're around sort of. 100 to sort of 500 euro per year in terms of your fees, your books and, and, and uniforms. But yeah, there's, there's a big difference there as well. I think in, in terms of your expenses, um, the, the secondary schools, and I think around say where I am, it, 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 they're all of the, there's mainly public schools there. There wouldn't be any sort of private schools around here that we'd be looking at or, con or considering. We'd probably, the kids would either need to go to a boarding school to, to facil facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, very good. And actually just back on, on the housing piece, and because mm. that expenses is going to be the cost of a house or rental if, if people return and they're renting for a period of time so any insights on that Erin? In terms of the rental the cost of rentals mm -hmm. yeah so I do I did sort of do some research just in terms of the, the cost of renting um, and you know you I think in terms of it's, it's generally per, per calendar month and I think in the more regional areas you'd be looking around the sort of I think even around here, some some places are around five fifty, six hundred euro per, per month, but they can range up to probably about a thousand, a thousand euro per month for, for a house or um or, or an apartment. But in in Dublin, I'd definitely be looking at something probably it's probably minimum of say two thousand, two thousand plus sort of in, in in Dublin in terms of rentals. Um, would you agree, Jean? Oh, yeah. yeah, like yeah. the country, say in the in the say the other cities will say like the Limericks and the Corks and the Galway, you you the the rents have started to creep because of demand and yeah. lack of supply. So you're looking at fifteen hundred in Limerick uh, to rent kind of a three bed semi, um, whereas in Dublin you're looking at well in excess of two thousand. Like yeah. a friend of mine renting an apartment. Now it's in a lovely area in Dublin, but there it's a two bed apartment for two thousand four hundred a month. So yeah, you know, there's significant difference from Dublin 
to the rest of the country when it comes to the rental market. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think I think the other thing is like the I found the gro cost of gro groceries and, and 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 shopping like that was a lot cheaper. I found here like you can get a lot of, like ribeye steaks for a pack of two amazing Irish rib ribeye steaks for like six or seven, or seven euro, yeah. um, a lot cheaper. You know, a liter of milk is around a euro. Um, you know, um, fruit and vegetables are, are generally fairly um, fairly cheap as well. We, um, I think when we were over in Australia a few years ago, we spoke about avocados because, you know, it was, uh, they can be quite expensive at times. So around 69 cents um, for a medium, I think up to a euro 50 here for, for a large avocado. Um, <laughs> I haven't looked up the, the, the rate of avocados at the moment, but yeah, <laughs> you know, eggs, eggs are around 350-ish for a dozen eggs, um, just to give you a bit of a ballpark anyway, in terms of that, those type of costs. and. And eating out, I think, you know, um, pub meals, I think you're looking around sort of around 12 euro, aren't you really, for a pub meal um, yeah. for, your, um, for your main restaurants. You'd probably be paying 15 to 20 for a main. Obviously, look, it depends on location and, and, and the type of restaurant that you're going to. Um, importantly, I think, you know, a glass of wine around here, probably five euro, Dublin, 10 euro. Um, <laughs> what, avocado, 5.50 in cold, that's crazy. That's crazy, you have to move home, Stephen. <laughs> It's a lot cheaper. Um, it's from Australia, to, or living in Australia, I take it, yeah? Yeah, yeah, Coles is, is the supermarket chain in Australia, yeah. Um, and a pint of Guinness, what, what are we looking around, five euro-ish, or am I? Yeah, a little bit cheaper in some neck of the woods. Yeah, yeah, it could be four twenty, but in Dublin then you could be going up to five fifty or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But even down to the hairdressers in Dublin, like to get a blow dry in Dublin is probably 40 quid, whereas where I'm from, Newport, it's 15 you know it's yeah. so it really varies here i don't know how much it, how much is a blow dry in australia oh it'd be it could be like 70 80 dollars depending on really well. yeah yeah your, your hair length and that sort of thing um and you know lattes a latte obviously coffee is important um to me three around three euro 30 or something for, for around a latte or three 350 is that is that the Guinness Sinead or, or the latte <laughs> or twelve euro for, or twelve dollars for a, a pint of bad Guinness in Sydney? <laughs> um, but I think in terms of groceries, like if you're looking at your grocery shop, you'd be looking around. I think people have estimated around 100 to 150 euro a week in terms of your expenses. Um, but maybe gone up a little bit since since COVID and, and lockdown. People aren't eating out as much, so you are probably spending more on your on your grocery shops and that type of thing. Well, Guinness, that's cheap, Sinead, three fifty. It's um, um, it's in Ireland, I'd say, is it? <laughs> yeah, I wonder where, she, where she's getting the Guinness from. Um, I see Rob, Robert was asking about um, integrating into Irish society. So, um, yeah, look, it definitely was, there was a, a bit of a culture shock initially. I had been, been in the area um, and I knew a lot of people, but it was still just integrating, but, you know, was, was a bit of a challenge initially. But I think once again, if I'd moved to maybe a rural region in Australia, I would have found it the same. Um, but uh, it takes it takes a little while to settle settle in. Um, I think when we finally did move into a, into a home, that really helped us to settle in a lot more. We were renting initially and looking looking to buy and looking for a property. It did take longer than I expected. Um, something that we'll probably cover up in a, in, in a future sort of episode is around sort of the housing market as well. Um, I think there's a lot more sort of stock available in Australia and it's easier to find somewhere to sort of move into quickly, whereas here it does it does take a lot longer and something you need to factor into in terms of settling in and, and um, you know, feeling at home as well. Um, and I think there was just a question there as well, just around the cost of settling in. Stephen, we, we, we will be doing more on that and um, and, and ha we do have someone that will be talking more around the, even the cost of, of relocation and, and relocating your furniture, the kind of, you know, do you bring your car and the dog? We brought our dog. Um, you know that that type of thing. Do you bring everything with you, or do you look at um, maybe the you know the cost of involved if you were to set up a whole new home when you when you move back? So we'll certainly be talking about that in in a future episode as well. And that actually leads perfectly into our conclusion. I think for today, we're <laughs> nearly at the hour mark. 
So uh, on that note, but first of all, thanks very much to, to Aaron and uh, to Jean uh, for, for joining me on, on today's webinar. I, th I think it was very informative and uh, we got to a lot of the, I suppose, the questions that people really want to know about mortgages and, and relocation here. And there can be a, a follow up afterwards as well to answer more of the questions that I'm sure others that will watch the webinar afterwards will have. So um, what happens next is we'll send out an e-sign uh, pretty soon over the next co coming days um, uh, with a bit of a, a summary on this particular webinar. And we We'd like people to I suppose just continue to follow us on social you're now anyone who's logged in today is part of crowdcast and they'll see our previous webinars and our next webinar um we'll probably go into more detail around migration issues and maybe some other topics that, um, um that, that I suppose get to the bottom of relocating over here the costs and things from social welfare through to you know um uh, different support structures so we'll come back with a little bit more detail on what that next webinar will look like quite soon um, Jean, again, is, it will be contactable in AIB after this, and um, we'll, we'll circulate her, her contact details. And finally, to, um, to just have a look at the jobs market and to get a handle on, I suppose, the, the careers that are over here, please log on to frsrecruitment.com. Have a look through our web pages. You'll see the consultants that work in specific areas, whether it's engineering or IT or finance, and maybe tie in with those guys to, to start looking at, at the career options that are over here. So thanks again. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to everyone who joined us, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you at the next webinar. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.